Let me run through the agenda very quickly. Uh, this is going to be a uh, very fast-paced session. There's so much to tell and so little time to tell it. So come on in, come on in. Um, so what we're going to do is um, uh, take about the first 30 minutes of this session for a little presentation. And Kevin's going to do 10, and I'm going to do, Larry's going to do 10, and I'm going to do 10 on three different parts of this presentation. And then I want to throw it open uh, for conversation, and I've got a way to do that I think you'll find interesting. So this is the agenda for the next 50 minutes. Uh, we're going to talk about the urgency of innovation. Why, do, why should we even worry about it? What's going on in our world that makes it important? What, is, what do we mean by innovation? I tell you, you cannot pick up a book or a magazine on business these days without seeing something about innovation. So specifically, what the heck are we talking about? And why does innovation and change belong in student affairs? What's the case for student affairs taking the lead on innovation? What is an innovation hub? And this is one of the key ideas that's in the book about really building an infrastructure for innovation within student affairs. We're going to talk about that. Uh, and then we're going to talk about change. Having a good idea. Innovation is about having a good idea that could create value, but actually bringing it to reality is a different matter. So um, I'm going to close out the discussion here, the presentation, with uh, a little peek into how to manage change, how to lead and manage change. And then we're going to briefly here, we have uh, two uh, wonderful folks from Seattle University uh, who I'm going to introduce along the way, who are, uh, have been kind of our beta site for creating the Innovation Hub. Uh, Michelle Murray and Monica Nixon, you might want to just wave there. Okay. Okay. And these are folks who have really been pioneers in implementing these ideas, and they are uh, not going to present, but they'll be available, and we've, uh, unfortunately we're going to make them famous. So you guys will be able to walk up to them during the conference and ask them how everything went. And then finally, we're going to talk about the leader's role. What is your role in leading innovation and change in a nutshell? So with that, I'm going to turn things over uh, to Kevin uh, to talk about the urgency of innovation. Great. Thanks, Al. Uh, it comes as no surprise to anybody that um, we are here uh, in higher education today with a sense of urgency. I think you all feel that. Um, and uh, I want to comment on you know, three aspects of that urgency. First, which you, some of you have uh, heard me say a little bit about uh, in a couple of sessions uh, already this conference, um, and that is I am uh, deeply concerned about the financial trajectory of higher education in the next decade. Um, I would like to be more optimistic about it, but I think that trajectory is very troubling, and it's being signaled in over 10 states right now where we're seeing, and some of you are probably in those states, where we're seeing um, uh, very uh, uh, substantial additional cuts to higher education um, that really undermines our ability to educate today's youth. Um, and uh, there seems to be an interest on states part, on some states part, to really disassociate uh, financially with uh, their state institutions. This comes after two decades of disinvestment in higher, in higher education by the public sector already. So this is uh, deeply troubling. Um, and uh, when we unpack the financial data for student affairs, despite what the media says about administrative bloat um, and the fact that student services somehow was at the root of the cause of the rise in tuition, which is the most ludicrous thing that you can um, really forward, um, but that narrative is out there. Um, when you unpack the data and you find out that in general, roughly, uh, between 8 and 10 percent of the university's budget is in student services, student affairs, um, uh, if you include all of the advising and other kinds of things in the iPads definition, it gets up to about 11 percent. Um, but but the, the way out of uh, the financial exigency crisis in higher education is not by eliminating student affairs. Let me just say that right away. It doesn't change anything. Um, but um, we all know that as the financial uh, uh, issues kind of roll through, that um, we will be subject to further um, challenges in terms of our, um, our funding. I think that makes the urgency for innovation incredibly important. And I think the, uh, the innovation that um, will, will arise in the next decade, it will be literally a transformation of student affairs and what, um, what, and the, the how we execute student affairs and the ways in which we do it. Um, and, and it will be driven by some of that financial, um, financial pressure. Uh, I, I think the, um, uh, the, the result of this, you know, it, again, we're going to be forced to innovate 
uh, in some ways by some of these external, uh, ex external financial issues. The state, uh, and just to comment on the states one more time, the, the state budgets are completely uh, unsustainable uh, going forward. The, the combination of pensions and prisons and medical costs and personnel costs. I mean, I really love, you know, no matter which governor, these governors run on these great campaigns. And if you look at the pie chart, you've seen this, the pie chart of how much discretionary money a governor has, it's like about that much. About the same much, same amount of money that a president has at an institution, by the way. Um, but uh, uh, the fact that they, uh, that, that, that the, one of the solutions for out of that financial mess is, uh, is higher education, and it kind of continues to be troubling. And you saw the Chronicle data last year. 40% of public, uh, privates and 36% of um, pri uh, publics did not meet their revenue or enrollment goals. Um, so, you know, we've well chronicled the, the shrinking high school graduation class, uh, but I think that those realities, I think, are going to hit us hard. And what's interesting among college presidents, as we poll college presidents about this urgency and uh, in, in the data from presidents, is that they uh, are not yet ready to make cuts. So that's interesting. Um, and so, so far, um, we're sort of skating by but you have seen this in your own institutions, but college presidents believe that the way out right now is to invest in enrollment management, in branding, and communications. Um, and that is, I would bet every one of the people sitting in this room will, would identify additional resources that have gone into that. Um, you know, if we just, like, just among friends, it's not going to work. <laughs> Uh, because we're all competing for the same folks. Um, so um, it will work for some of you, and it will not work for others of you. Um, so that financial uh, issue is going to put some pressure on us. And I think, you know, uh, and, and I've said this a, a number of times, and you're going to hear it again from me, the age of specialization in student affairs is coming to an end, that the vertical silos that we've built over the last decades have got to be dismantled, and we need to find alternative ways through innovation to do our work differently um, to meet the, the needs of our students today. Um, and that may mean at the micro example, having residence hall directors serve as academic advisors, or as Shannon Ellis in the back shared with me yesterday, having her financial aid advisors do financial planning for families. But we simply have to think about broadening the specter of skills and responsibilities that student affairs staff have. It's a necessity, and I think that's part of the innovation we're going to see. Let me comment on something else. Um, the, um, as I mentioned last night in the opening, again, no surprise, but the, um, but the enormous challenge we have as a higher education community in closing the achievement gap for low-income, first-generation students is the challenge we face for the next decade. Um, that we simply cannot have a, a society where if you are low-income in the lower quartile, that your chance of getting a college degree in 10 years is 14%. It's unconscionable. Um, and so we, as educational institutions, have to undertake this mission. And I believe that much of this will fall on student affairs in partnership with our academic colleagues. Um, I believe that is another place where we have the need for tremendous innovation. And there is innovation already occurring in this space. Um, uh, lots of, uh, of emerging programs that are showing really encouraging results of how we can increase the attainment rate for um, those who are underrepresented in our, in our college um, completion uh, uh, area. So I think that's another area that is sort of driving, uh, uh, driving innovation, needs to drive innovation. Um, we need more innovative practices. We need more evidence-based practice about what works um, that we can share with each other. And I think that kind of notion of an innovation hub around that subject could have some real promise. Um, I th would say the same thing about um, the fact that we have to also position ourselves um, as uh, persistence and completion um, experts uh, um, and resources for the students who are not first-time, full-time 18-year-olds. Now, that may not be part of some of your missions, but as you know, the, um, the, that population is in increasing dramatically in the higher education sector. Certainly anybody in the community college sector already knows this. Um, anybody who's in a regional, regional public knows this. Um, but we have to be part of the success strategies for post-traditional and non-traditional students. It may actually also be to your financial advantage to do so, because as that high school graduation population shrinks, all of us are having to pivot and look at alternative re revenue sources, and that's one that is out there, and I think student affairs should articulate the role it plays in this emerging population. Third thing, I know you know this, um, but, but the, the very nature of what is college, what's a credit, what's a course is being challenged today. And this has enormous implications for the work that we do. Um, uh, you know, a lot of people 
three years ago thought that MOOCs were the big disruption in higher education. Um, uh, thankfully, even President Stanford has come out and said, yeah, it's not really a tsunami. Um, you know, we're going to wait and see a little bit. Okay, well, that's great. Good. Um, but I think that, um, uh, you know, for me, the MOOCs were simply the evolution uh, in, of, of teaching and the teaching enterprise that we've seen since the first satellite was uh, beamed to classroom in a distance way, we, that the nature of teaching is changing in some really exciting ways, and that's really as an inno a part of the innovation. Um, now, what's, what's coming is what the disruption, I think, is, is competency-based education. Um, when we start to unpack what a course is, um, that you don't have to sit for 16 weeks in a, in a classroom in order to get credit for something. But I might be able to sit for eight weeks, and if I can demonstrate I know something, I can get credit for it. And if I can know it before I sat in the class, I can get credit for it. What's, that is enormously disruptive to the model that we have in higher education, where we expect students to enroll and take 120 credits at our price point. Parents, families, adults, students are not going to pay the same price for our prior learning assessment and for competency-based education than they will for the traditional 16-credit course, a 16-hour, yes, I mean 16, um, sitting 16-week course. Um, that changes the financial model of every institution because you built your model on those 120 credits or those, or those 60 credits of your community college, whatever that model is. And so when we disrupt that, they're not going to pay the same amount of money. Now, some of you are saying, we're not playing. We're not, we're not taking company. We're not, we're not, we're not going to take them. We're not going to give them. We're not going to take them. And so you will be on the sideline as the competitive market forces overtake us, and you'll see your institutions increasingly jockeying for those competency-based education credits. Um, and so the reason I mention this is because I think this also is a disruptive force for us. And we have to also think about so the impact of that on the finances of our organizations, but, but uh, also what does this mean for the ways in which we interact with our students? If increasingly college becomes a three-year experience, that means we lost the freshman year. What does that mean in terms of innovation for the ways we will then interact with our students who lost that important year of discovering themselves and their interests. Um, and so things like career services and advising and coaching and all the kind of things that we're imagining change when you take away the freshman year with more three-year degrees that will come about as a result of some of this competencies-based education. I'll close with just, just the peak um, when Janet Napolitano, who's president of the UC system, um, proposed to Democrat Jerry Brown her 10-year plan for how to re 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 have the UC system regain the crown jewel status in the country. She, um, she proposed a series of uh, tuition increases over the next 10 years that would allow funds to return to the UC system. Democrat Jerry Brown said, no thank you. Um, I want to see more three-year degrees and more competency-based education. So often what happens in California sweeps across the country. That's a signal to us about you know, the trend in terms of how I think we should see things going. And that is disruptive. So the need for innovation is enormous. It's, um, I believe that um, it should come and, and, and will come from many of you sitting in the room here because student affairs is about success, student success. It's about access. It's about supporting students in completion and retention. And so I think that those efforts um, uh, wrapped around innovation are really, really, really critical. And so I'm happy to have been a part of this book project and, and looking forward to hearing the two gentlemen here say more about innovation in higher education and our role in it. So thank you. danger is falling off the podium here. Uh, raise your hand if there's a seat next to you that's open. So those of you who want to come in and have a seat, please just look. Raise your hand if you're a chief student affairs officer. Ooh, okay, all righty. And raise your hand if you're a community college, four-year institution. Just wandered off the street. Okay, all righty. So, as Kevin said, the future is in the present, but the present isn't in the future. I got to make sure I don't go over 10 minutes here. And so Al is going to time me because we're really pushing hard. So uh, we know who our students are in America for the next 18 years at least because they're all been born. Right? Very few more people are going to be born who are 17 and 18. Usually they start out at a much earlier age. And so 
the present is not the future, but the future is in the present. We could look and isolate certain things, but for some reason we have a difficulty in doing that. Innovation, by the way, is doing things different, doing different things differently. Everything that's new is not an innovation. And one of the problems that we have had, we have copied from one to another thinking that's innovative, and if it didn't work at school one, it doesn't work at school ten. And I'll give you a good example, as retention rates haven't changed in what, 50 years. And yet we've spent tons and tons of money on all these associations and organizations that have brought us together and sold us consulting and services, et cetera. And the number hasn't changed. And why hasn't it changed? It's basically because what we've been doing has made and enriched the current education of those who would have persisted anyway. This is one of the things that we have uncovered in our conversations. We don't have uh, a different opinion on it. So the only way to break this problem is to get out of the mold we're in and look at it from a different context. There are two kinds of innovation. There's disruptive innovation and there's sustaining innovation. Basically, innovation is connecting two previously disparate ideas and creating higher value and newer opportunities as a result. <clears throat> So Henry Ford did not invent the car, he didn't invent the assembly line, but he changed the world because he combined the two, paid people enough to buy them, and that transformed the American society. Creating the light bulb, that was a major disruptive innovation when you think that everybody was using whale oil and kerosene and other ways to illuminate their daily existence. It turned night into day. It opened up a whole new opportunities for society. Those are disruptive innovations. And we have many that are confronting higher education. Kevin mentioned a couple. Some of them we can control these forces, and some of them we can't. But when we create the innovation to deal with a disruptive force, it has to be a disruptive innovation. Sustaining innovations are making current things bigger and better. They're improving what we do. And we'll talk about how we get out of this bind in just one second. So sustaining is change for continuous improvement. And I think Kevin really answered the question, why does innovation and change belong in student affairs? When you look at the next 10 years in America and you look at the corporate world, what is their focus? It's on the customer. How many of you use Amazon or bought something from Amazon? When you buy it, they know 25 different things from all the databases they've searched, plus all the decisions, all the pages you search etc. We need to do the same thing. The one thing that everybody in higher ed has to focus on, unless you're just a research professor or in a medical area or something, but you, the thing that you have to focus on is the consumer, the student. We have the student as our domain. We know nothing about the students. We have speaking generalizations. We really do not have the concept that Amazon has or Facebook has, et cetera. We have not even explored how that works. If we have, and I ask you to raise your hand, how many of you in this room at the end of an academic year bring your faculty, bring your student affairs staff, bring your frontline people together, bring your RAs and all of those kinds of people, how many of you bring them together to say, what have we learned about our students? And who are our students? Our students are not just freshmen and sophomores. They're not just juniors and seniors. They're graduate students, professional students, and on the graduate and professional level students are students who are transfers who have families. Their families constitute the student experience as much as the individual does in many ways. So how do we reach these people? How can we do it with limited resources when 80% of student affairs budgets in terms of most of the institutions that we've worked with are focused on the first and second year undergraduate students. How do we do this when we don't have new resources? Obviously, we have to reallocate resources. And therein lies the problem. How do we reallocate resources? So we have come up, as a result of our efforts over the last five years, with we call our five, and I know if you're sitting way in the back, you can't see them by the book, you'll see them, but we'll give you, this is going, this is going, uh, we'll be on, on, our, on our website and hopefully NASA's website as well. But the five innovations for change, the five innovations that we feel really are those that are going to guide the next 10 years are the areas, the domain areas for innovation. And 
our understanding our students, and this is, we sit on a mound of data in our institutions. We are basically filled with data in different silos all throughout the institution. We have to bring that information together. We have to add to it, and we have to really use that information to track and understand who our students are, not just our freshmen to sophomore and our, et cetera. Anyway, preparing students for a changing world. If there was one place to start, it would be on the changing world of work. We do not give great information in career services. The trend to combine career services and academic advising, which is going on on many campuses that we've encountered, has resulted in career planning people becoming academic advisors. It hasn't resulted in a new level of information and insight. And yet, most of us are in communities where there are tremendous resources of people who understand what's happening in their fields. We never bring them to campus in any meaningful way. This is a student affairs function, whether it's part of career services or not. It's helping students understand the new world in which they're going to live and how to prepare for it. And when you look at the blend of the trance of the generation of uh, uh, the outgoing generation of, of the millennial students and the incoming generation of the touchscreen students, uh, there's going to be a major shift just from them. I mean, there are so many things to learn and to find out, and we have the access to a lot of the information, but we don't use it. So integrating effective and adaptive technologies, creating high-value student experiences, which I will talk about in another minute, and operationalizing the search for meaning and purpose. One of the things that really unites today's students is the search for a personal meaning and purpose in their lives and how to live an extraordinary life. And we have to stimulate and we have to provide insights and direction. But the irony is when you reach my age, it's not only young students, it's people who are adults who are coming back to college to enrich learning after retirement. There's a whole groups of people who are searching for this. And this is something that Student Affairs is uniquely uh, in a position to help uh, look at. So, in addition to the five domains, over the years we have developed what is a combination and a crystallization into something that has face meaning. What are the major factors that integrate the Tinto and Braxton and Stedman and all of the theories and all of the best practices, et cetera? And we came up with seven concepts that can guide us. One is approachability, how comfortable the university makes me feel, accessibility, ease of access to necessary university resources, affordability, cost of time and money required to obtain my degree, associability, opportunities available to participate in university social, cultural, and academic life, applicability, help afforded by the university in reaching my long-term goals, attainability, Confidence that I can complete my degree at the university in quality, the confidence in the educational quality of the university or college or educational experience, not only by me, but by people who might want to employ me. But if you could focus on those A6Q and the five domains, and we'll show you how to do this in one second, uh, you will have a new student affairs program that speaks to the needs and trends that are buffeting us about. So one of the things that we recognize is that the present really holds the future hostage. You know, you go back to your campus and the first thing you talk about change and the first response that everybody makes is what? How does this affect me? And everybody is an expert at protecting their silo. Everybody is an expert. There is nobody, we lack no, ex, no, no, no loss of expertise in protecting what we do. And so being a change agent and being an innovator carries with it a special level of opportunity and a special level of difficulty. So we have created a concept that is in of itself a disruptive innovation to create new innovations. And we call that the innovation hub. And the innovation hub says, in, and you, you probably will have to reallocate resources to make it work but it is in charge of the disruptive domain, the five concepts that I just mentioned earlier. And that innovation hub helps develop uh, an innovation infrastructure. It serves as a division's core for leading innovation. How much time do I have? Three minutes. Okay, it creates <laughs> demand and awareness. It drives disruptive and sustaining innovations. It connects across functions. And most interestingly, it serves as a model for other divisions to emulate. There is no reason why other areas can't also have innovation hubs.
But somewhere we've got to start, and there is no better group than to start on a campus with innovation hubs than divisions of student affairs. Because we are charged to provide the best outstanding experience. We're not tied by all the traditions that encumber faculty and faculty affairs and all the administration of and problems that deal with people who are basically see themselves in a different role. That is our mission. Our mission is students, it's student welfare, it's student success. So the innovation hub with the five dynamics that we uh, and, and domains that we mentioned. You can see it touches every single student service, whether it's under the Vice President for Student Affairs or not. And our feeling is, my feeling especially, is that if we do what we should be doing, that soon in, in the future that all these kinds of services, as the universities be organized to be more effective and cost efficient, there's going to be a whole new definition, as Kevin mentioned, of what student affairs is. And those of us who get there first and do the most are going to be those who benefit from it. Those of us who sit on the sidelines or resist it, we're going to disappear. There's a book out called The End of College. If anybody has not bought it or read it, you should read it, and you will see that uh, the voices are converging, and, and I think there's a lot of agreement on what the future is. So we developed with the hub, the hub matrix. And if you looked horizontally, the, the hub in the Division of Student Affairs is responsible for creating programs, activities, and services that are innovative in those five domains. And that cuts across everybody. And the hub uh, is basically staff as, with a full-time person. It has its own staff. It's not a temporary work team. However, it uses temporary week t work teams that it draws from within the Division of Student Affairs and across the campus. But basically, the hub cuts across everything we do and has the basic responsibility and authority for creating innovative programs to deal and to disrupt and to sustain. But the sustaining innovations, which are coordinated by the hub, the seven eight, A6 Q, the seven things that I just mentioned before, affordability, approachability, accessibility, et cetera, those are the responsibility. These are sustaining innovation areas for the transition period. How do we make what we do more effective, reach more students, and create higher value opportunities for them? And those are the current administrators of the silos. But as the hub keeps doing its work, there will be a migration as to where the focus is in the silos. There will be, and it's because you cannot go in and just disrupt everything. You can't go in and say, I'm changing the whole world all at once. And this is a step-by-step -step concept that will provide the opportunity to bring about change. One thing that I have to mention, there are three parts of the process. One is creating ideas. But a new idea is not an innovation, it's a new idea. Giving that new idea utility, combining it with other ideas to make something new happen, that's innovation. Creating high value for a new, for, to reach your your students, something that is new and different that cuts across. Change is how you implement innovation. As a chief student affairs officer, you do not have to be innovative, and you do not have to be a change agent in the direct sense. You have to lead innovation and change. You have to support innovation and change and make it happen. You have to become conversant with the language of innovation and change and leadership. You have to move from the management modality to the leadership modality. We believe in our work that leaders are made, not born, and that people can learn the skills that require them to be, create an innovative and change environment on their campus that is a wholesome activity rather than one that destroys and threatens. Seattle University is a good example of where it's working. Uh, and uh, we're very proud of what's happening there. And I think that they could attest to what it is that we're saying. So change. Doesn't isn't a revolution, it's planned, innovative evolution. And so with that now, okay. your turn. <clears throat> oh. Okay, before I go any further, um, we are working hard to build a community of like-minded folks. And I've got a clipboard here. If you'd like to give us your name, your email, very happy to put you on our mailing list. 
if, and this is an offer only for the people in this room, if you would like a short in laser focused telephone consult about an issue that's bothering you, just mark the last column here and we will get in touch with you over the next month. And if you have, this would be like 15 to 30 minutes of just how do I deal with a particular problem relating to innovation and change. So that's one. Secondly, although they didn't all arrive, we do have some brochures here about this whole uh, innovation hub, so you can pick those up at the end. So I'm trying to race a little bit so that we can have time for you to interact with us. So let's talk about the change moving from idea to reality. I have spent most of my professional life as an organizational development consultant working in all sectors, and it is all about change. So let me tell you what I have learned in 20 years about making change happen. The first is this model, which is as, to me, as valid as E equals MC squared. And that is to say, if you want a change to happen in an organization, there are three factors that have to be present. The first is, and what Kevin just provided for us this morning, is the D. The D stands for desire or dissatisfaction. Mostly it stands for data. The more people know, the less likely they are to be satisfied with the, con with the current state. So motivating people to want to change is the first step. That's part of the job, but that's not enough. Secondly, you need a vision of the future that's compelling and exciting, a picture of possibility that gets people turned on, that says, yeah, that's worth fighting for. That's something I'd like to see happen. But that's not enough. You also need first steps. You need a pathway to the future. And so what has to happen is people need to say, where do we start? Where can we start next week? And if you have all three of those, and you'll notice that in this formula, it's D times V times F. And thinking back to your math, what happens if any one of those is zero? <laughs> Nothing happens, right? Okay, or very small even. Now, you're pushing against the, the red block there, the R of resistance. Resistance doesn't have to be conscious or intentional. Your systems provide resistance. Your structures, your job descriptions, everything, your traditions, your habits, your budget practices, all of it provides resistance that tends to keep the organization going in the direction that it's moving. And so part of your job in leading innovation and change, when you want to get to the change part, is to make sure that there is the right mixture of D, V, and F so that people will begin to move in the direction of the change. Now, here's another thing that I have learned, is that change is, there is unfortunately a habit that people have of either sending out a memo and saying the change begins on Monday, um, or, or they, call a, they call a town hall meeting and the boss stands up and talks for 58 minutes and then says, are there any questions? Oh, good, not. Okay, well, let's go get it, guys. This is fantastic. If you really want change to happen, it's a process. And that process is a process of alternating large group and small group activities. The purpose of the large group activity is to get people aligned, get everybody on the same page. It's why football teams huddle before they run a play. Then what happens is you then go out into small groups, and it's either in your functional groups or a task team. People do something. They try something. They go out and run a play. See if it works. Then you come back again, and you, you huddle again, and periodically you learn. So when you look at this, you're saying, so how do we create alignment, action, alignment, action over time? So now, if you turn that into a roadmap, and here's a simple five-step roadmap. For those of you in the back of the room, aren't you sorry that you didn't come up and sit closer? Um, but it begins with small group work, with leaders, getting aligned themselves, you and your direct reports, figuring out what are your goals, what are, what's going to happen, what's the story that you want to tell, what are the things you want to achieve. Now, probably that group is going to be like five or eight people. Now, expand that to their direct reports. Now you've got 15 or 20 people. Get them aligned. So now you've got, in your division, you've got 20 people who are looking at this in the same way. They're on the same page. And then create a divisional innovation workshop and Michelle and Monica can tell you we were last December right? So we were there doing it and what happens then is that people become invested and they get a chance to help create the future they not only learn they actually get a chance to help create it 
And then now we're back to small group work. We're back into, depart into departments and functional groups, trying things out. We got task teams who are inventing new things. And so you go out and do something, and then you start to measure results and give people feedback. And that big green circle that's where that's the target that you want to hit is you get action, you get results, you celebrate success, you abandon what's not working, and you get engaged in continuous learning. And for those of you that are familiar with W. Edwards Deming, the plan, do, check, act cycle is the basis of all kinds of continuing, sustaining innovation. So here's what innovation and action looks like. I don't think these ladies have seen this, but this is from last December at, this, at Seattle University at the Innovation Workshop. And what you see are people energized. People breaking up into groups out of their silos. They're mixed up, the whole division. How many people there were? Like 60? Uh, on the first day, it was 100. It was 100. OK, so we had, we had a lot of people and running those kinds of, you know, running a meeting where there's a lot of interaction, a lot of uh, excitement, and people come away with things they want to try. So all of that said, your job as a, as a leader the leader's role, there are three things, if you read the book, there are three things, there's three chapters devoted to this, okay? The first role is to be the chief visionary person. Now, you don't have to invent the whole vision, but you've got to be looking to the future and you've got to have a point of view. You've got to be able to inspire people and say, we can create something that will excite us and we can fulfill our potential as student affairs and we can help this institution fulfill its potential to our students. Secondly, you have to become an architect. You may have to redesign, as, as in the case of Michelle, we now have a, an AVP for innovation in Monica. So there's a, a redesign, potentially, of the way you're allocating resources and the way you're structuring your, your uh, division. You also have to be an architect of that change roadmap. You have to figure out what's the timeline, what are we going to do, how are we going to help introduce this, how are we going to communicate it, and finally, and this is where, you know, this is, you know, innovation is the breakfast of champions. And what it means here is that you have to be an ongoing, vis visible, public, and cheerleader, and roadblock remover, and you have to be the person who says, let's do what's important. Let's, let's put aside whatever your personal preferences are, and let's work on organizational objectives. So for you, these three roles are kind of the new definition of leadership that are going to help you transform first your student affairs function and then the whole institution as you try to create a future in which, as Kevin said, everything is changing, everything is up for grabs, and there, won't be a, there will not be a more important time for student affairs to create that linkage. Student success means student aff aff affiliation, student uh, uh, wanting to say, hey, I went to such and such a school, and believe me, if they took all their classes online, that's going to be a challenge to have them wear the t-shirt and come to the football games and all of that, so, and to become a donor, which is kind of where you want to be. Okay, so that's our story. What I'm going to do, we have, how are we doing on time here? We got 10 minutes. Okay. Well, yes, and what I'm going to do, yeah, can we, we can pass this around and we're going to be down, uh, we'll stay over, I think we have until, we can certainly stay here for a few minutes after, right, Kevin? Yeah, well, there's nothing here until 10. Okay, sorry I asked. Okay, all right. So, you're going to have to bear with me now. I want you to take three minutes, turn to a person next to you, and talk about what you just heard and what your reaction is to it, and if you have a question or a point that you want to raise, now we're not going to have a ton of time, and when I call you back, I want you to come back, okay? All right, so find a partner, have a discussion about what you heard, your reactions, and what question or comment you have. Go.